Well, welcome to the second session of this year's National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium Brown Bagger webinar. If you haven't already, certainly encourage you to visit the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium website. Among other useful materials, you'll also be able to find the recorded sessions of these webinars, including previous year's uh, series. I'm your host today, Matt Spangler. I'm a faculty member at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, and I, along with my colleagues, Bob Weber at Kansas State and Dare Bullock at the University of Kentucky, are certainly pleased to have been able to put together and offer uh, this webinar series to you guys. Today's session is going to focus on improving cow productivity and longevity. And we have two speakers today, the first of which will be Dr. Warren Snelling. He's going to visit about some of his more recent work focusing on stability and other tools to select for efficient cows. Warren, as I'm sure many of you know, is a research scientist at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. Warren completed his bachelor's degree in animal science at Kansas State. And then after graduating, he spent a couple of years in industry, one at a Hereford ranch in the Texas Panhandle, and then another year actually in the feedlot industry near Tribune, Kansas, uh, where he was a pen writer. Um, he then decided to continue his education at Colorado State, where he received both a master's and a PhD, his PhD work with Dr. Bruce Golden, whom I'm sure many of you know. After that, Warren spent a couple of years as a postdoctoral research associate at the ARS facility near Miles City, Montana, working with Mike McNeil. After his postdoc experience, he went to Beef Booster in Calgary, Alberta for about five years before winding up uh, in Clay Center, Nebraska at U.S. Mark. I'd also note that Warren received the BIF Continuing Service Award in 2014. Our second speaker today is going to be somebody who uh, obviously this audience would know quite well, and that's Dr. Bob Weber from Kansas State, who's going to talk about some of his group's work that have focused on the genetic evaluation for feet and leg structure. Bob is obviously a professor and extension cow-calf extension specialist at Kansas State. And before arriving there in 2011, he served in a similar role at the University of Missouri. Bob's focus of his extension and research programs are really uh, to broaden the availability, use, and understanding of genetic selection tools in the beef industry. Bob grew up on a cow-calf operation in Southern Colorado uh, and then went on to earn a bachelor's degree in animal science at Colorado State and a master's of agriculture degree in the beef industry leadership program also at Colorado State. He received his PhD from uh, Cornell University and while working on his PhD also served as the interim director of performance programs for the American Simmental Association and previously uh, he was the director of education and research at the American Gelby Association. Bob has received numerous awards, but two that I would highlight are the Midwest section of the American Society of Animal Science Extension Award and the Beef Improvement Federation's Continuing Service Award. So with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker today, um, which is Warren Snelling. While Warren is bringing up his slides, I might remind the audience that if you have questions for our presenters, please enter those into the chat box. Okay, is that showing up? Looks good, Warren. Okay. Yeah, so, <clears throat> You know, this is a little bit of work I've done recently, but it goes goes back to, you know, what we did at Colorado State um, when we started with the stability EPD. Um, so there's a little little history to go along with with this. Um, you know, just 
for for some introduction, um, you know, in selecting for efficient cows, um, the main the main de definition I have for efficient for an efficient cow is that she's a fertile cow, and you know, so you know, when we started developing EPD, um, we were looking for something to select for cow fertility. Um, you know, there's you know, a lot of the economic work, you know, emphasizes that reproduction is more important than calf growth or carcass characteristics in any sort of production system index to improve biologic or economic efficiency. And, you know, some of the work here, you know, from Tom Jenkins and Cal Farrell was, you know, showed that variation in fertility explains more variation in biological efficiency than cow weight intake or calf weight. Um, you know, some real simple impacts of increasing fer fertility on herd efficiency is that, you know, for one thing, you're going to more increased fertility gives you more calves and and then you can don't need to cull as many open cows, so you don't need as many replacements. Um, so you're not spending as much developing those heifers, and and then you have fewer heifer calving, heifers calving, so lower dystocia and higher calf survival. Which you know, so all the way around, you get more calves, um, and you know, some of the tools that we talked about a long time ago for selecting for fertility, um, you know, we could use, you know, birth weaning and yearling weights and somehow, um, and then calving ease EPD and scrotal circumference. Um, you know, with, for birth, with birth weight and calving ease, we can select against dystocia, against dystocia and the effects on calf survival and rebreeding. Um, you know, with the growth EPD, birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight, we can try to avoid the large high milk cows that might not be able to stay in condition and and rebreed. Um, and you know, with lower condition is associated with lower fertility. And you know, scrotal circumference has been used to select for earlier puberty and heifer pregnancy and you know with and the you know the heifers that conceive earliest are expected to have the highest lifetime productivity but you know none of those were a real good answer and you know we started working on stability as a, as a way for, you know, instead of using the other EPD for indirect selection for fertility, um, we came up with the idea of stability as a tool to direct, directly select for some measure of cow fertility. Um, you know, and we started with, a definition of stability to the age of six. Um, you know, we're about half the, you know, the data set we started with the, for Red Angus, that about half the cows were gone from that data before they reached six. Um, and some of the econ economists we worked with were saying, you know, about six years old is about the break even age for a cow to pay for her development and maintenance costs. Um, you know, so a cow being in production at the age of six is a useful indicator of fertility if reproductive failure is the primary calling criteria. Um, you know, if there's other reasons for a cow being called besides with reproductive failure, then stability might might not be that good an indicator of fertility. 
um, you know, some, you know, when we started with stayability, we didn't have the whole herd reporting that we do today. Um, you know, so our original definition would have allowed a successful ob observation, you know, with with two calves reported, just one before and one after the age of six. Um, and, and in that data, we could not distinguish between reproductive failure or failure to report a, the failure to report the calf to the association. Um, you know, so whole herd reporting can fill some of some of those those holes by requiring a annual record on each breeding female. Um, you know, that could be you know record of the the calf or a reason for not having a calf or, or you know, calling reasons, um, and that's allow better definitions of of stability, you know, where now at least some associations require a calf every year. Um, you know, and and that stability to six, you know, means you don't get an observation in, until the cow's at least until the cow's six six years old and her sires at least eight, um, so we don't we don't have you know any you know all we have on the young younger bulls are EPD that are um, low accuracy parent averages. Um, you know more recent work at CSU looked at stability to younger ages and. An aggregate stability that include observations on younger cows and and then some work out of Guelph, you know, looked at stability to consecutive calvings with a random regression with using observations for each op opportunity to calve. You know, another problem with stability is that, that it's a binary measure either success or failure so we don't pick up differences that might be you know where we ideally cows are going to conceive early in the breeding season and we don't get the difference be see anything between early and late conception in the stability observation um, so you know with the records that we have now um, we started thinking of some other things we might look at in, instead of stability. Um, you know, the you know one thing you know, I know see, there there's a little bit of work early on on some cumulative productivity traits, and then you know with the random regression approach, we can you know. We can do a cumulative pro productivity with observations for you know every opportunity a cow has to has to calve. Um, so that so that you know those you know the records from each breeding season might be more informative than just a single observation of stability or some other productivity trait. And we're also interested in how stability might be related to cow weight and efficient and efficiency. So, and we have annual record, at least in our germplasm evaluation data set, we have annual records of cow weight. So we can, you know, look at correlations between pro productivity and weight. Um, some of the existing literature says that it, that weight is negatively correlated with stability, um, and some early work, you know, show the negative relationship between cow weight and the number of calves weaned and total weight weaned by a cow. Um, 
the traits we looked at for this work um, included counts of number of pregnancies, number of calves born and calves weaned by a cow over her lifetime. And we did some continuous observations for the calf age at weaning, or what, I'm, what we might call days nursing. You know, and that's rough equivalent to the days to calving that the Australian use in, Australians use in their evaluations with a, where in days to calving, they add a large penalty for when a cow doesn't wean a calf. And in days nursing, it's the opposite where, you know, a cow has an observation like say 200 days if the calf's 200 days at weaning and you know, that observation would, would be zero if she didn't wean a calf. Um, and also, we also looked at the actual weight weaned. Um, you know, her typically, in, when comparing calves, we need to adjust for calf age to fairly compare the calves. But in this case, we want to, you know, look at the actual weight for, for the adjustment will mask the differences between cows due to how old that calf was. Um, we accumulate, for this, we accumulated records for, <clears throat> for each year that a cow was exposed. And in and, and this herd, we allow cows to slip from spring to fall and vice versa. You know, when, you know, when they're open once and they'll, we'll just keep, usually keep them at least one more, one more chance, you know, in the next breeding season. Um, you know, some distributions, you know, these shows, the next few slides will show distributions, you know, by cow age, um, you know, where, you know, the number of calves weaned starts out as bim bimodal, you know, up through about four years of age. And then we can start seeing a, you know, little bump on the, the, the third, the third bump where, um, you know, calves might have, cow for the cows that, that may have, missed two calves and you know in this data set it, you know we do see cows that have you know there's an eight-year-old that never weaned a calf um, and the days days nursing you know start looking a, a bit more normal and and the Weight weaned will be about is about the same. Where you know these traits are a little little bit more normally distributed than the count traits. Um, you know, in the random regression approach, we get heritability projected out to each age. So the you know all all of the productivity traits you know, lowly heritable in two and three year olds and that increases with age. So, you know, at six to eight years years of age, the you know, the all the productivity traits are reasonably heritable. The continuous traits um, you know the Weaning age or days nursing and weight weaned are a little bit more heritable than the count traits and the cow the cow cow weight is highly heritable across all ages and you know there's looks like we have a little inflated heritability towards the end um, that I think is just an artifact of not many cows 
contributing to the older observations. Um, and we, we get the same sort of projections for um, correlations among these traits. Um, you know, and so within, let's see this, within, you know, either the productivity or the weight traits, you know, all, you know, all the ages are positively correlated and there's a, you know, slightly negative correlation between weight and productivity. Um, you know, the, the, cor the correlations, the negative correlation is a little bit stronger between calf age and cumulative calf age and cow weight than it is for the other traits, but it's weakest for between calf weight and cow weight where, you know, the, the heavier cows might conceive a little bit later, but those calves grow enough to make up for the difference by the, in weaning weight. Um, you know, so there is some, you know, so our data sh shows that the heavier cows tend to have younger calves. Um, there's some, some weather, I found one report out of Guelph that showed a similar phenotypic relationship between you know, gestation length and cow weight, where the gestation length increased a little bit with increasing weight, and you know, we we get the same sort of relationship from our AI records. Um, you know, and you know, going back to the you know the and the weakest correlation between is between cow weight and cumulative weight wean so you know that sort of goes with the younger calves from the heavy cows may compensate for being slightly younger by a, by faster growth um, and you know another looked a little bit more at our records on on cow weight and, you know, we're thinking, you know, lower body condition might explain the tendency for heavier cows to have lower productivity, but it's, our data says the opposite that, you know, most of our heavier cows tended to have higher body condition and, you know, where, you know, <clears throat> And in, in our data, cows within a standard deviation of their content, contemporaries mean, you know, had, we had very few obese cows, but almost a quarter of the cows <coughs> heavier than a standard deviation, than the mean plus one standard deviation were, were in condition score eight or nine. And, you know, there is some literature that, you know, those obese cows may have lower fertility than a cow in good condition. Um, also took a look at some other indicators that we might measure on heifers to see if they might be related to cumulative productivity. Um, you know, where, you know, Bob Cushman and our physiology group has done a lot with antral follicle counts and also reproduct reproductive tract scores. The tract scores are highly correlated with the 
pro productivity at young ages, but we don't really see much relationship between the follicle counts and cumulative productivity. Um, you know, there are some problems with these analyses that, you know, the our track scores are mostly, you know, fives and sixes, which which are heifer cycling. Um, you know, where the difference between the five and six is whether or not they've ovulated. Um, and you know, our data includes some. The GPE data includes Indicus influence females, and there's a strong relationship between, you know, Indicus content and follicle count, where where the Indicus females tend to have a lot higher follicle counts, but they don't have the fertility that we'd expect from a in a Taurus heifer. So there's so I'm redoing some of this work to look at some other indicators that, you know, based on these two traits that might work work better. Um, and you know, some other things we did on you know in our cumulative productivity work was you know, looking some at some responses to selection. Um, you know, where, you know, the cow weight increases that we see throughout the industry is, you know, probably a response, a correlated response to selection for calf growth. And if we, you know, the re relationships we found in these data just following the industry yearling weight trend for the yearling weight EPD trend would we would you know have pretty some decline in productivity but probably wouldn't be noticeable over year to year fluctuation. Um, and we could overcome that <clears throat> that decrease in productivity simply by calling open two and three year old females. If we, you know, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, if you, we want to, you know, selecting maternal bulls for, and, you know, selection for fertility, we can keep bulls out of, out of older cows. So, you know, if we, you know, call, call our open females and save our bulls from cows that would have had a successful stability, um, we might get a little bit of increase over the, the decline and we'd expect from selection for yearling weight. Um, and we'd get a little bit better if we use EPD for the productivity traits, um, you know, you know the taking the top ten percent of the productivity EPD bull calves would double the progress over selecting bulls out of six-year-old or older cows, and if we look at accuracy consider accuracy and pick the highest accuracy bulls, then we get a, a lot more noticeable increase in the productivity traits. Um, you know, to try and summarize this, um, you know, we started with the stability EPD um, and, you know, that gave us that gave us a start, but also put us on the road towards more complete cow productivity records. And the, rec the records we've collected since then might allow a more comprehensive evaluation of female fertility and efficiency. Um, and, you know, the records we can get on the young cows are 
informative to project DPD for productivity at later ages. Um, you know, so we can get some accuracy on young bulls without waiting for their daughters to mature. Um, you know, there's a, the, indus, the industry trend of increasing cow weight is correlated to selection for calf growth, you know, may have a slight effect on cow productivity that, you know, can be overcome by calling for reproductive failure and we can get a more noticeable improvement selecting sires for their daughter's productivity. Um, you know, some of the things we really need to work on now include, you know, bioeconomic values for the productivity and weight EPD, um, you know, working, you know, maybe working these traits into selection indexes um, and also some work on genomics, you know, trying to identify, eventually identifying functional variants that might be responsible for some of the variation we do see in cow productivity. Um, you know, one problem and and the genotypes we have right now is that, you know, we've got lots of cows around, but we may, that, that are genotype, but we may not have the genotypes on their contemporaries that have been called before, before they were genotype. So we're, you know, there's some, there may be some selective bias, unintentional bias in whatever we do get out of genomics until we start getting complete, complete genotypes on, on females. Um, so, you know, that, that's all I have on this. If I'd, try and field any questions. I don't know how that's going to work on this. But. Yeah, thanks, Warren. If, if people have questions, you can type them into the chat box and I'll wrangle them and, and ask our, our speakers. Um, Warren, why, why perhaps Bob is, is transitioning his slides up and we see if there's any questions. I've, I've got a couple for you. On, on the trait that's essentially weight weaned, are those records, you said they're not adjusted for age of calf, which makes complete sense, but are they still adjusted for sex of calf and perhaps age of dam? Okay. They're not adjusted for age of dam because we're comparing within same age calves. Oh, that's right. Yep. Yep. And I've, I did, I've ran it a couple ways with and without a sex adjustment or, you know, and actually the sex adjustment was, um, I'd have to go back and, you know, it was essentially, a, you know, counting steers, bull versus heifer calves. Okay. I Maybe an, another uh, just quick question, Warren. I, I appreciated the response to selection uh, values you had on one of your last slides. And I was trying to understand uh, the last two scenarios. One was using EPD on, on essentially young bulls, and the next one was EPD on, on high accuracy sires. And it looked like there was about a four to five fold difference in the response. And so I was just curious of the assumptions you made about um, what was high accuracy and what were the age of the bulls that were high accuracy? I didn't look at those at the ages. And and I th I think I used to I'd have I'd have to go back and Look, I, th I think I used the 
think of a point eight. Okay. Yeah, where I, where I was getting to is there'd have to be a, a pretty big difference in accuracy because you're you're also going to increase generation interval in that, and I, right. I was curious about that trade off. But yeah, well, good. Well, hopefully uh, uh, Warren will be able to stick around to the end in in case uh, you guys think of additional uh, questions, but. Um, I do want to transition over to, to Bob Weber, who's going to visit about the, the work um, he and his group have done on the genetic evaluation for feet and leg structure, which I, I know is something that's uh, certainly on the mind of uh, at least a lot of seed stock producers. So, Bob, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, appreciate uh, your hosting duties today and, uh, and the nice intro. Warren, uh, good job. I, I found your work really interesting on the sort of cow longevity and, and really appreciate your thoughtfulness there. Um, as we sort of start thinking about uh, genetic evaluation for feet and legs, um, one of the things that will become uh, obvious to you all as we uh, start through this, uh, my comments aren't constrained entirely to cows, um, and, and I'll explain um, part of my motivation for that in, in just a minute. Um, but uh, before I go further, I want to just acknowledge some of my uh, uh, colleagues and co-authors. Um, uh, Lane Geis and uh, Brady Jensen were the two graduate students, uh, master's students here at K-State that worked on um, uh, these projects really. And uh, Dr. Jenny Borman, uh, a colleague and faculty member here at K-State in our animal breeding and genetics group, um, has helped a lot on these evaluations as well. And um, in fact, uh, we, we've sort of been tag teaming our um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So uh, she's she's the author of a, a number of slides in this in this talk as well. So um, tip of the hat to uh, to Dr. Barman, um, who I know is, is listening and watching. So she'll recognize some of these slides. So um, like any good extension professional, I'm not recreating the wheel entirely. So. Um, but one of the uh, um, uh, the first questions that uh, that came to mind as I was working on this and sort of working through the um, the session title, which is largely focused on cows or on cows rather, was to um, sort of think through a little bit about who's really impacted by feet and leg issues in in the in the beef value chain, and um, um, the the two maybe closest to my heart, I guess, are, are cow-calf producers. Um, and so, you know, they, they experience on occasion breeding bulls that have feed issues that require them to be culled um, perhaps earlier than they normally would be removed from the from the breeding herd, um, or influences on uh, cows or replacement heifers with feet and structure problems um, that result in culling. And obviously, if that's in, in uh, young cows um, bears a significant amount of capital loss as those females exit the herd before they've uh, recouped their uh, replacement development costs. Um, another group though that I think um, um, is, is, is substantially interested in this topic um, is really seed stock producers. And um, uh, here at K-State, uh, we sell bulls and I know Matt, uh, you supervise a unit that, that does the same thing. Um, Getting bulls back because they have some kind of problem either related to breeding soundness exams, or fertility, um, or feet and leg structure turns out to be um, a, a challenge for us, and we don't get very many of them back, but um, um, refunding money through a state account um, is really difficult. Um, and, uh, and and it doesn't provide very good customer service to our, our clients. Um, and so we're um, really thinking about, um, you know, trying to minimize the impact of feet and leg problems as it relates to bulls that are moving out of our seed stock units uh, and seed stock business into the commercial sector. Like many of the seed stock breeders I talk to uh, around the country that are, that are you know, working in this area and have identified a need for improvement, um, you know, they really look at it as, you know, making sure the product we sell lives up to our customer expectations. And I think that's a, a very reasonable um, sort of motivator for um, uh, genetic improvement in this particular set of traits. And so one of the questions is, well, are feet and leg traits really ERTs or are they indicator traits? And uh, I think depending on, on how we look at it, they can be either. Um, but for bull breeders, um, a feet and leg confirmation as it relates to decreasing costs, i.e. returned bulls, I think can certainly be considered in ERT. If we think about the feet and leg structure in the cow side, it's probably more of an indicator type trait um, as it's related to stability or cow longevity, some 
sort of reproductive performance um, or, or longevity sort of focus um, of those cows. But um, uh, in, in either instance, I think there's some, some good opportunity for us in the business to do a better job in terms of some of these conformational traits and, and, and producing um, bulls or feeder cattle um, that uh, are, are better in terms of uh, feet and leg structure. Um, and so, you know, other industry kind of motivators in, in the value chain include, um, you know, problems that we've seen uh, in, in the media related to feet and leg structure in, in feedlot cattle. Um, some of those may be related to some nutritional issues, but certainly um, uh, some of the conformational ones arise regularly as well. Um, and so severe lameness, um, not just a production problem or a cost problem, it's a, it's a welfare issue. And our good stewardship sort of uh, necessitates that we focus on genetic improvement in this area to decrease those number of welfare incidents um, in, in our production system. Um, and I think the other one that's that's uh, notable here is, is cow longevity. So you know, anytime we call a female um, before um, uh, her productive life is, is really um, paid back her uh, development costs, we experience a loss and, and that lost productivity um, can amount into, uh, into real, real dollars. And if it's got a, a genetic component, um, we should certainly consider uh, making some genetic improvement uh, in that area because we know replacement females end up being uh, one of the major cost centers in, in beef cattle production at the cow-calf level. Um, and certainly breeding soundness exams, um, you know, veterinarians that are um, evaluating these yearling and two-year-old bulls for um, sales, they, they should and do look at their feet and um, um, ones that have problems. Um, I, I'd encourage any of the veterinarians on here, if, if you don't already call some for, for bad feet, um, uh, continue um, to look at those and, and, and potentially include that in, in some calling criteria or, or BSE reporting criteria. Um, certainly uh, longevity, um, we talked about here just a second ago, but um, that helps offset those replacement costs um, and uh, a key component to herd, herd level profit. Challenges and opportunities related to feet and legs. Um, um, one of the, the the key ones, I think, is is sort of working through at least as we approach the problem, um, deciding what to score, and uh, and certainly recognize that uh, in in some cases the traits are are a little bit difficult. Um, in, in in cases, some training is very helpful, and certainly doing a good job in terms of uh, footing uh, or the the surface that the animal is standing on when you score them um, can make a really big difference in how easy or difficult it is to score those phenotypes. One of the other ones is uh, the unknown relationship between um, uh, conformation and soundness with longevity. So there's not been uh, a lot of work done to look at uh, on, on the beef cattle side, you know, the relationship between, say, heel depth or claw set um, and cow stability. And so there's, there's some opportunities as we collect more of this data um, to, uh, to look at that and understand those relationships a little clearer. And, and certainly um, that begs some sort of inclusion in selection index as a, as a, as a way to, uh, to weight that economically and include it in our uh, breeding objectives. Um, some of the benefits obviously here of scoring and evaluating soundness. Um, I think one um, is that we get to understand those relationships with soundness and, and longevity. Um, putting uh, some kind of objective number to structure um, can can provide this data for genetic evaluation. And so it's important that people, um, you know, use a rubric and, and do a good job in, in trying to, to score animals effectively. Um, and that um, data collection then allows for production of, of EPDs. I think another thing it does is, um, uh, that's not on the slide and, and kind of just popped in my head is again, this consumer or customer focus. Um, you know, things that we select for people interpret as we care about. Um, and I think that's true for, um, you know, commercial customers that buy bulls, um, but certainly um, as we interact with the, the general public um, and talk about genetic improvement programs, if, if those include um, uh, some welfare or confirmation, lameness kinds of traits, um, I think that highlights to our consumer that we understand that those are uh, important issues and, and, and ones that we should um, strive to improve in our, our production system. So um, the $64,000 question really is what to select for. And this is one I think that's going to be an evolving discussion over time. I know um, through some engagement with, uh, with IGS and, and uh, folks at, uh, at the Angus Association, um, there's 
uh, opportunities to, um, um, I think, collect more data, both in terms of, of potentially traits or, or uh, phenotypes, um, but also repeated measures. So kind of understanding how um, these traits evolve over time as the animal ages uh, are important to understand. Um, but uh, as, as we approach the problem, um, the things that uh, we put on the list included shoulder angle, um, front leg knee orientation, um, uh, front foot uh, uh, or hoof attributes that include toe angle, toe shape, and heel depth, um, hip or stifle set, or hip and stifle set, so uh, rear limb angulation, um, hock set, again, another rear limb uh, angulation uh, characteristic, um, rear foot or hoof attributes, toe angle, toe shape, and heel depth, um, and then finally, um, we put in one that included foot size, so are they small footed or are they big footed relative to the perceived size of, of the animal? Um, Recognizing that in some cases those those real small footed animals um, suffer from you know a lot heavier weight bearing uh, per square inch of foot area um, than an animal with a, say a larger size hoof, and uh, our our rationale for starting to think through um, sort of the limb to hoof relationships is um, for those of you that have done any kind of, of phenotypic or, or judging evaluation training recognize that you know those limbs um, are all connected, um, you know, all the joints uh, are connected and shoulder angle affects, you know, how the foot and, and, and toe um, performs in those animals. Um, likewise, uh, rear hip um, and hip set um, and, and hock set um, affects, you know, how that rear foot um, uh, comes to the ground and, and, and grows in terms of um, toe shape and toe length in particular, heel depth. Um, and so one of the things we, we hypothesized was maybe it's, it, it might be easier to train people to evaluate shoulder angle and, and hock set um, as indicator traits um, to help inform um, the hoof attributes uh, a little more effectively. And so we included um, all of these in, um, in our, our work here. Um, before I get into that, I wanted to just uh, point out some sort of corollary work uh, over in the dairy business that was actually a, a good motivator for us to, to tackle this problem. They had um, uh, data that uh, Jack Deckers and others at Iowa State did in the mid-90s, um, uh, found moderate genetic relationships between type traits or confirmation traits and longevity in, in dairy cattle. Um, and recognizing that these longevity traits tend to be lowly heritable if we can um, figure out indicator traits that might be useful in, in improving those accuracies um, may be uh, an opportunity for us. Um, the heritability is out of the dairy studies, um, you know, foot angle, um, so that's the, the front angle of the toe um, as it goes up to uh, the coronet band into the pastern, um, represent somewhere between a 0.1 to 0.12 kind of range. Um, rear leg side view, so this is primarily um, hock set from viewed from the side uh, between 0.15 and 0.22. Um, rear leg rear view, so this is, you know, our cow is hocked in or hocked out, so um, uh, when viewed from behind, um, uh, between 0 0.06 and 0 0.11, um, and then some composite score of soundness um, uh, between 0 0.13 and 0 0.4. So not markedly different than a number of the traits that we have under selection in, in beef cattle. Um, you know, these kind of fall in the range of, of calving ease um, and some of the growth traits uh, on the upper ends. So um, certainly, uh, at least in cattle, uh, a heritable component to these conformation traits for feet and legs. Um, the, uh, the Holstein Association actually publishes a set of these traits in their genetic evaluation system um, that involve uh, feet and legs. Um, so rear leg side view uh, has a heritability of about 0.21, a rear leg rear view, so that's the, do they cow in or not uh, from behind, uh, 0.11, uh, foot angle 0.15, um, and then a feet and leg score composite heritability of 0.17. I think the really interesting bit is that they, they calculate a feet and leg composite index from these traits. And that feet and leg composite index is included in um, uh, sort of a net merit or total performance index um, at, at the Holstein Association. So they recognize the connection between these confirmation traits and expected productivity of um, those Holstein cows as they work through um, their productive life in lactations.
Okay. Um, research on the beef side, uh, just a, a quick couple of notes to, uh, there's not as much literature on the beef side um, as, as there is on dairy, but uh, um, Dave Kirsten, um, during his master's work at Montana State in, in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, used um, uh, a set of data collected through um, ABS on their uh, GTS or genetic trait summary data um, and had uh, about 13,000 records for a variety of um, uh, type or confirmation traits and found heritabilities for these feet and leg um, traits in the, in the point twos, so encouraging. Um, some international data, Italian Chianina looked at uh, um, uh, confirmation scores um, for hind leg structure. So um, they found that the, the really straight or post-legged animals um, from behind had uh, a much higher probability, 59% higher probability of being culled um, compared to uh, females that had more moderate uh, hind leg angulation. Um, and the ones that were kind of really sickle hawked or had a lot of angulation, um, had a markedly lower probability of being culled. So in these cases, we often see that to one direction from what we perceive as optimum as humans um, in our evaluation um, tends to have maybe a little bit lower uh, impact on um, functionality than the other direction. So in this case, you know, the really extreme straight-legged ones um, had uh, a lot higher probability of culling than the ones that were more sickle hocked, which would tend to, we would say, have more um, flex or suspension to them um, uh, as they move through the production system. So um, the other group that's done uh, a lot of uh, work um, uh, recently in, in beef cattle um, and published in 2012 was uh, the, the data collected through uh, Australian Angus. Um, and they initially uh, reported in this study um, about 7,000 records analyzed and uh, uh, across these six traits, so foot angle, uh, front claw shape, uh, so front foot angle, front claw shape, rear foot angle, um, rear uh, claw shape, um, rear leg hind view, and rear leg side view. So again, these kind of limb angulations in the back uh, of the animal. And um, um, uh, good heritabilities here. So point threes, uh, upper point twos um, for many of them. Um, the rear leg uh, attributes a little bit lower than the foot or hoof characteristics, um, but still uh, pretty modest um, heritabilities of 0.17 and 0.2. So this was some of the, the real founding work um, um, at, at the Beef Cattle Breed Association level um, to get us motivated to, uh, to collect more of this data here um, stateside. And um, uh, American Angus is, is working uh, uh, with a, a similar scoring system here. These are images provided um, uh, in the publications from Australian Angus. Um, that um, I wanted to show to get kind of in everybody's uh, head what these phenotypes look like. Um, so measured one to nine, um, and this is um, um, uh, claw shape. Um, and so we have these kind of really open and divergent uh, uh, claws to ones that have, you know, a fair bit of curvature um, and crossover of the toes or scissor claws, it's sometimes called, um, scored out here to nine. Um, ideally, we like to see animals kind of in the middle of this scoring system somewhere around a five. Okay, so that's claw set. Um, uh, front foot angle, uh, rear feet angle, um, is primarily a reflection of heel depth and toe length. So those two things are, are closely connected. Um, five is desirable. Um, as we move up in, in numeric score towards nine, those animals tend to get fairly shallow heeled. Um, and so um, the toes tend to grow out a little bit more on those cattle. And so they kind of get long toed and shallow heeled. Okay. Um, uh, rear limb angulations, um, so these are um, uh, when viewed from the side, so one down here is a real post or straight-legged um, rear limb uh, on a critter. Um, a nine is one that's got a fair bit of, of curvature or set to their hock, um, and we like to see them somewhere kind of in the in the middle again of this, this scoring system. Um, uh, rear leg rear view, um, so this is, um, you know, do they um, at the hock here, um, the hock joint, do they bow out? Um, that's a one. A nine is one that's real cow hocked from behind or, um, you know, uh, hock joints uh, close to each, other, to each other when viewed from behind. Again, a five is, is desirable where that um, 
hip to hawk to, or hip to stifle to hawk to pasture is all kind of in a straight line. Um, we have a tendency to think those are the, the most structurally correct or soundest animals. Um, and so they're kind of in this, this middle category of five. Um, so taking from some of that work, American Angus has initiated a, a, a scoring system and, and genetic evaluation. Um, at present have uh, in excess of 20,000 uh, observations. Um, and so breeders uh, are actively collecting that data um, and they score uh, two traits. So foot angle. So this is the kind of the toe length heel depth uh, characteristic um, and claw set and, and score the worst foot on the critter. And uh, when they do that, uh, they find heritabilities for uh, both traits of around 0.25 and with a, a, a slightly positive but low genetic correlation of about 0.22. So um, this heel depth and toe issue is separate uh, largely from um, the claw shape and claw set issues. Um, so two kind of distinct traits there. Um, and uh, they've used a, a variety of uh, breeders can send that data in as well as um, they work closely with a number of collegiate judging teams to go out and collect that data in the field. Um, one of the things we've found uh, in, in interaction, uh, at least here at K-State with, with breeders on this is sometimes if they don't have a pretty strong judging background or livestock evaluation background, they're not real comfortable collecting these phenotypes. Um, so some training and, and mentorship and in, in data collection can really be um, helpful in building confidence to score these. They're, they're pretty easy to score once you get the knack for it, um, but sometimes people are a little, little hesitant to do that. Um, some uh, kind of broad guidelines here, obviously score them before trimming hooves. Uh, hoof trimming uh, has a tendency to correct those problems, obviously, that's why we do it. Um, score the wor worst hoof, um, score at yearling time, so um, typical yearling uh, age collection windows uh, apply here. Um, they do take data on mature cows, um, into that genetic evaluation um, at present uh, or into the database at present the um, um, the traits aren't in a repeated records model um, but that's certainly something I think as we move forward um, and collect more data on uh, particularly older cows um, starting to understand that progression of phenotype from a young animal to an older animal um, can be very va valuable um, in those predictions and so um, that's something we need to work on um, as, as we kind of move through our kind of evolution of these traits, okay? Um, one of the other things that, and, and I didn't point this out earlier, but is, is really a challenge in these traits is that they're in uh, kind of a, a set of traits that we think of intermediate optimum. So uh, a five is ideal um, and a one is not good and a 10 or a nine is not good. Um, and so thinking through how we analyze and report the data takes, uh, takes a little bit and, um, uh, to that end, um, you know, inspecting the data to find out where the, the distributions lie and where the records live um, aids in that. And in fact, in the, in the Angus data, they found that they had very few records less than a five uh, on either trait in their data. Um, and so by simply, you know, editing those records out and focusing on uh, the majority of the data or vast majority of the data that's a five or greater um, uh, helps simplify that analysis procedure some. Um, and so they report an, an average EPD now is 0.5 in those traits. And so selecting for a number that's closer to zero improves um, foot or hoof structure. Um, and that's a, a really important sort of interpretation that unlike a number of other EPDs where, you know, the bigger the number of the, we sort of have a, a inherent perceived improvement um, in these traits actually getting closer to zero um, is, is viewed to be more ideal or towards what we think as humans is the ideal structure. Um, and they've recently, and, and again, sort of uh, a hat tip to uh, uh, folks thinking about the economic importance of these, um, included in the, the new dollar M index at, uh, uh, at Angus. So um, feet and legs uh, structure plays a role in a maternal index. And I think that's a, a really valuable evolution of, and, and useful way to kind of use and interpret this data. Um, some of the work we've done here at K-State, and I, I wanted to spend uh, a couple of minutes here kind of highlighting some of the work we did um, uh, in Red Angus and Simmental cattle. So we've got uh, really two kind of parallel projects going um, in Red Angus and Simmental. And uh, 
we wanted to investigate those relationships between feet and leg structure and production traits. Um, and so I'm going to summarize, uh, Elaine Geis is currently working through uh, and, and added a, a fair bit of records to our Simmental data. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll leave that to, to Lane to summarize for us at, at some point. Um, this is going to focus on the, the Red Angus portion of that data that both Brady and Lane worked on in their thesis projects. Um, and here's the traits that we collected. So there's, uh, I think, 13 of them on here. Um, and um, um, so we had body condition score, um, all the front and hoof angle, uh, heel depth, claw shape, side view, knee orientation, um, front foot hoof orientation. So we, we captured a lot of data. Um, and we would score these animals uh, at least two uh, trained observers for each animal, um, and it would take a couple of minutes apiece um, for each of these evaluations, so a, a pretty big uh, investment in time to get all the data collected here. Um, some of the uh, traits that we looked at, um, in addition to the ones I've already described that came through in, in the Angus uh, data from either the U.S. or Australia, uh, include this knee orientation or front uh, feet side view, so kind of the knee and shoulder, so these animals that are buck kneed um, or calf kneed. Um, and I should point out, we used a, a zero to a hundred scaling. Um, one of the things we were interested in is do we lose information if we go to a very coarse scaling of one to nine? Um, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. Um, but we scored from zero to 100. Um, so buck need would be down here at a 10, calf need where they're back at the knee, um, uh, up at a 90 and uh, 50 is kind of the perceived ideal in the middle. Um, uh, front feet, front view, or uh, you know, head on kind of view if they, um, you know, knee in or knee out. So if they're kind of uh, pigeon toed or bow legged, uh, whichever way you want to think about that. Um, it was one of the phenotypes we looked at. Um, rear leg um, side view, so cow hocked. We already talked about this one in the Angus data. Um, rear view of the hind limbs, again, scored zero to 100. Um, and um, of course, we captured the data to, to observers, um, and then we averaged those to reduce uh, score bias. Um, had 1,720 animals in the evaluation represented. Um, uh, a pretty sizable chunk of the uh, population here in the Midwest. Um, and here's the distribution in, in age. So, of course, mostly yearlings and two-year-olds, a few three-year-olds uh, as we collected that data. Um, and so not, not atypical of when you go into these herds that they're sort of front-weighted on, on age, both as a representation of sale bulls that were available to evaluate, um, but also uh, fairly large numbers of replacement heifers retained in those herds as well. Um, here's the age distribution of those uh, uh, females um, and the males. So obviously most of the bulls we evaluated, uh, well, all the bulls we evaluated were one or two-year-olds. Um, females ranged from yearlings up to, um, we had a few kind of aged cows up above 10. Okay. Um, heritability estimates out of our um, uh, analyses um, were fairly similar to what we observed in, in other literature, either beef or dairy. Um, kind of the upper teens um, in many cases or uh, low point twos somewhere. Um, so we were encouraged by this, particularly given how small a data set we had um, that uh, we were able to find these uh, uh, heritabilities and um, some of the genetic correlations that existed between traits. Now, I'll, I'll warn you that it's a fairly small data set. So um, even though these genetic correlations have fairly small standard errors, there's there's probably some room for movement as more data comes in. Um, but what we found was the front foot hoof angle and front foot heel depth. So that toe length to heel um, is is really the same trait, essentially a heritability or genetic correlation of uh, about 0.9. Um, the front foot uh, hoof angle and rear foot uh, hoof angles, uh, so the same trait just measured front or rear, um, a strong genetic correlation about 0.88. Okay, um, front foot hoof angle and rear foot heel depth 0.85. So these traits, the, the hoof traits were strongly correlated um, for toe angle and heel depth front to rear and trait to trait. Um, the um, um, uh, rear feet, same same kind of relationships here. Um, strong genetic correlations between those uh, hoof attributes uh, amongst them. Um, we did find here though um, 
uh, the, the front foot claw shape. So this is, are they kind of scissor toed or, or divergent in their claw shape? Um, a little bit lower genetic correlation, but still fairly strong at 0.75 between the front feet and rear feet for claw shape. So um, we found um, uh, our sort of conclusion was that, um, you know, a strategy of uh, either combining those uh, scores or evaluating the worst foot um, is really not uh, an unreasonable way to, uh, to capture that data um, because of these strong relationships that exist. Okay. Um, uh, other genetic correlations, so these are the foot uh, attributes related to limb attributes, so um, front foot hoof angle to front leg side view, uh, correlation of about 0.46. These weren't actually as strong as I thought they might be, so again, those limb to hoof relationships are all connected in the geometry of the animal, um, but genetically some uh, lower correlations than what we saw amongst the hoof attributes um, as you work through that, uh, through that list. Okay, um, the rear foot uh, and rear limb attributes, um, the previous slide was the front feet. Um, this one is the rear limb and rear hoof uh, attributes, somewhat stronger uh, in terms of their genetic uh, correlations, at least numerically, um, probably not statistically different, but at least numerically different here. Um, which I thought was kind of kind of interesting, um, but again, um, uh, some some relationship between you know as we see animals get straighter on their back legs, they tend to have more heel depth and shorter toes and so forth. So, okay. Um, one of the interesting things uh, that that we did in the project, at least I thought was interesting, was uh, compared. Um, uh, evaluation of the scores on this one to a hundred scale um, versus if we just went and truncated the data into into nine point bins um, did we lose a substantial amount of information when we did that truncation so we didn't round we just truncated and um, um, what you observe here is that the the heritability estimates are within typically about 0 0.02 um, units um, when we went to the the compressed scale or the the coarser scale uh, as compared to the really fine scale. And so that, that tells us a couple of things. One, I think is um, a one to nine or one to 10 scale is, is fine enough. Um, or um, the one to 100 scale, we're not able to be this sort of an accuracy versus precision kind of argument um, that we may induce um, you know, some measurement error as we try and decide, you know, is this one a 65 or is it a 67 instead of just calling it a six and moving on. Um, so that was um, um, one of the things we wanted to look at was to, to, to help provide a recommendation of um, you know, a, a one to nine scoring system really is a, a reasonable way to attack this problem. Uh, so key takeaways here real quickly, I know we're a little bit, uh, little bit over time. Um, uh, feet and leg traits have low to moderate heritabilities. Um, if selection pressure is placed on traits, um, we can achieve genetic change. Um, and if we apply the directional selection, certainly we ought to be able to make improvements um, in feet and leg. Again, one to nine scoring system we concluded was uh, a reasonable approach to that uh, problem. And we found that these strong correlations between uh, particularly the foot uh, or hoof traits um, and leg traits indicated some uh, uh, common control by similar genes or pleiotropic effects there. Um, we also found that the um, you know, those foot traits were highly correlated um, front to rear and amongst attributes, so we could kind of condense those down um, as we make recommendations. So um, the nutshell is we probably don't need to measure 13 different structural traits to capture the meaningful stuff of feet and leg differences uh, in our beef cattle that we have under selection. So um, with that, um, I'll flip it back to you, Matt. Glad to answer uh, uh, any questions. And again, Warren, appreciate the uh, opportunity to share the stage with you today. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, if anyone has any questions for, for Bob or Warren, um, if you could kindly use the, the chat box to, to type them in. Relatively quiet group today in terms of questions. Um, let's see. Uh, this question is for you, Bob. Did you have a genetic correlation of foot size and bow-legged, either front or back? Sorry, I'm bobbling the mute button here. Um, I'm sure we did. I would have to go dig in the um, in the slide deck here and and pull that out. Um, and uh, I'll I'll try and. Um, 
effectively do that here because I think that one's in in one of the summaries. Um, so that would be front hoof orientation or front knee orientation. Um, so what was the other trait again, Matt? So the, the question was genetic correlation of foot size. Oh, foot size, right. And bow legged, either front or back. Okay. Um, let me so, look here. so did you capture uh, hoof size? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna have to do some do some digging. If whoever asked that question, shoot shoot me an email, and I'll I'll dig it out of our analysis. Um, I'm I'm sure it's in there. I just don't have happen to have that summarized in uh, um, in the slides here, um, which is probably a um, indicator that uh, maybe it wasn't real remarkable. So, yeah. All right. Well. Um uh, again, thank you to, to both of our speakers today. Um, sincerely appreciate the time that both of you spent with us, and, and I think some exciting work. Um, I just want to remind the group of the third session that will be on uh, the 23rd of October, so a week from today, where the focus will be the future of genome editing and food animal species. Um, your host will be Dr. Dare Bullock from the University of Kentucky, and Dr. Allison Van Eningham, uh, certainly uh, somebody a lot of you would recognize is going to visit about genome editing and cattle, recent developments and prospects. Um, and then Dr. Megan Rolfe from Kansas State is also going to spend some time visiting about the Beef Improvement Federation guidelines in a wiki form. So a lot of people might recall that at BIF this past June, um, uh, a revised uh, set of BIF guidelines that are uh, on the web in a, in a wiki format were released. And so Megan's going to talk through what those changes uh, really entail and, and perhaps uh, encourage you to take a look and provide feedback. So uh, hope to, to have you all back on here a week from today at noon central. So with that, uh, sincerely appreciate the participation um, and we'll see you guys back here next week. Thank you.